He's a malware researcher at Checkpoint and comes from the Israel Institute of Technology. And he's going to tell us something about key stream reuse and how to avoid to spend nights and nights trying to understand a crypto protocol. But w was it worth the time to use, I mean, in terms of spending your night developing these other software for automatizing this instead of checking by yourself? This. Let's see. Thank you. Please give him another round of applause. Uh, hi. I'm Ben. I'm from the Checkpoint Malware Vulnerability Research Group. Uh, this was mentioned earlier, but I felt like mentioning it again. Uh, what I do is uh, I look at the uh, applications of theoretical computer science to problems facing that we come across in the, the InfoSec field. And uh, in less whitewashed terms, what this means is, uh, is that uh, I am an uh, amateur mathematician who has infiltrated the industry somehow. Don't tell anyone, especially all the people working with me. Uh, it's hard enough to keep this under covers as it is, considering that uh, when I handed my boss the first draft for this presentation, he took one look at it, and he said, you're really going to present this with all of those formulas, they're going to lynch you. So first of all, please don't lynch me. Second of all, I really tried my best to take away most of the formulas. There's one formula somewhere in one of the slides. Uh, so this talk, as I said, it is about uh, automatic detection of uh, key reuse vulnerabilities. I would like to dive right into that. Unfortunately, first I'm going to have to explain what the key reuse vulnerability is. And unfortunately, to explain what that means, I'm going to have to explain how a stream cipher works. So let's go over it as quickly as we can. OK. This is how a stream cipher works. Basically, there's this machinery called the pseudo random number generator. And the pseudo random number generator accepts a short key and outputs what, what basically looks like noise. To anyone who is not familiar, with the key, it looks like noise. Uh, and what uh, you can do is you can use it for encryption. How? You insert the symmetric key known to both parties trying to communicate, say uh, Alice and Bob. And uh, the pseudo random number generator outputs this key stream that looks like noise. And you XOR the plain text. Here it's the smiley image. And you get the ciphertext, which is a plain text X or the key stream. And to the uninitiated, anyone who is not familiar with uh, the key or the key stream, it looks also like noise. This is a property of the XOR operation. You take a nice plain text that you XOR it with what looks like noise. You also get something that looks like noise. Next, what can you do now? There's the uh, ciphertext, it looks like noise, but if you XOR it again with the same key stream, which is what Bob on the other side of the communication will do, you get the plain text back, back again. Why? Because this is another property of the XOR operation. If you XOR something with the same element, whether it's noise or not noise, twice, you get the, that element cancels itself out. You XOR with noise, you XOR with noise again, the noise cancels itself out, and you get the plain text back again. So. What's key reuse? Key reuse, astonishingly, it is when you reuse the same key string twice to encrypt uh, two different plain texts. And uh, as you can see, let's uh, take a certain key. This is the key. And we XOR the plain text with uh, the first plain text with a key and the second plain text again with the same key. And we get two bunches of noise. As we said earlier, if you XOR with uh, noise, you get something that looks like noise, unless you know the key in advance has generated the key stream. And now Eve uh, stands in the middle of the communication. She's eavesdropping onto the, on the communication. And she gets this uh, noise and this other noise. And it all looks like noise to her. And of course, she can't do anything. And there is no such thing as a curious vulnerability. You can all get up from your seats and go home. Uh, no, not really. Uh, this is what happens if you encrypt two different plain texts with uh, the same key. It is possible for Eve, who has access to both ciphertexts, to XOR the two ciphertexts. And what did we say earlier about having the same element twice in an XOR operation? Here, the key appears twice. You have the first plain text XOR the key, the second plain text XOR the key. And if you XOR the two ciphertexts that resulted, the key cancels itself out, and you get this, the first plain text XOR the second plain text. This is not something that you want to enable. 
as you can, I can see here, it's very easy for Eve to take a look at this thing and uh, have a very good idea of what the original plain texts were. Now, this is due to the redundancy in the two original plain texts. In our context, the context that we will be working with and uh, mentioning in a moment, it's a bit more difficult than that. It's not so obvious. It doesn't just jump out at you like that. In fact, there's a whole uh, uh, effort and the algorithms dedicated to extracting the original plain text like that. But this is an example, so you can look at it and see how horrible this vulnerability is if, uh, if it exists. It's not something very nice. So, what is it good for? Why do we, we want to detect curious? Here's the first example. This is a document for the Venona project. The Venona project ran for 40 years, from the 1940s to the 1980s, initiated by the USA to eavesdrop on a Soviet communication. This was started before the NSA even existed. And uh, the Soviets, they were uh, reusing their key streams, their one-time pads. A one-time pad, when used correctly, it is an unbreakable cipher, but they were reusing their one-time pads. And uh, what happened is that uh, the vulnerability that we saw earlier arose because of that. And uh, US intelligence was able to extract in, uh, information from those encrypted messages for the following 40 years. It isn't the case that the Soviets continued sending vulnerable information for 40 years. It was only for four years, and then they wised up. But for 40 years, the Americans continued working on this project and extracting more and more information, and they got all sorts of useful intelligence, including the names of, uh, and uh, identities of spy rings and such. So this is one use for it. If you can look at the traffic and say, "Hi, huh, there's been curious here, that's helpful. You can then start to attack the traffic and look for information. This is another use. Now I will be shamelessly promoting my uh, colleague Nitai, because he's awesome. Nitai, uh, earlier this year, he researched a certain uh, ransomware variant called DearCrypt. It's basically like a cryptolocker wannabe. It infects your computer and it starts encrypting your files. Um, unfortunately, as Nitai uh, dug deeper into the source code, he found that uh, DearCrypt commits uh, curious. It basically it uses the stream cipher RC4, this is a good point to mention that everything I'm talking about right now, right now applies only to stream ciphers and one-time pads, which are like stream cipher, not block ciphers like uh, AES and DES and the like. And I found out that uh, that's what happens. There's uh, every single file encrypted by decrypt using uh, RC4 uses the same key. It was a five-letter key, black in all lowercase. And uh, this means that uh, all the encrypted files could theoretically be recovered using, uh, depending on redundancy in the plain text. Anyway, it's not something that the malware author planned on. Now, the funny thing is that we didn't even have to go that far because the malware author actually included the key in every file. We don't really know why. Uh, probably it uh, seemed like a good idea to him at the time. And so, Unless uh, the malware author uh, had uh, done this thing, uh, it, we could have uh, recovered that plaintext or a uh, large part of the plaintext anyway, because uh, this comes to use. Now, if we had a way to look at the files and come to an epiphany, there's been key reuse here, Nitai would have had to sit down in front of the screen looking at Ida Pro, and uh, his eyes are, uh, there's tears of blood in his eyes for nights and nights on end. We could have just uh, looked at uh, the files and say, hey, there's a curious vulnerability here, and proceeded from there and saved a lot of time and effort. This is uh, something similar. This is traffic from the Ramnit malware. Ramnit malware uh, came out around uh, 2010. It uh, still credentials and it was used to commit uh, financial fraud. And uh, Ramnit uh, sends its traffic uh, in a special homebrew protocol over port 443. It's not actually SSL, but it's over port uh, 443. And this protocol contains blocks, and some of the blocks can be encrypted. And uh, every single block is encrypted with the same key, with the pseudo-random number gener generator restarted before every use. So basically, here you have key reuse on the block level. Every single block is encrypted using the same key. So if we can look at this traffic and uh, understand, suddenly look at it and say, oh, there's been curious here again, that's useful because coming into this traffic, we don't even know anything about it. And now, just if we could, just from looking at the traffic, say curious has been committed here, that's interesting. Not, uh, we don't expect key reuse in uh, regular traffic. 
And uh, this is our last example. Uh, lest you think that only malware authors and shady characters commit curious, uh, Microsoft uh, committed in, in the, the 2003 version of Office uh, in their document encryption function. Basically, every time you saved the file, you modified the file, and you saved it again, it was encrypted again with the same key. The key was bound to a file, it was a single key every time. And someone who monitored your directory over a long time could look at the files again and again and see as the basically different plain text, different files are encrypted again and again with the same key stream. And uh, this enables a curious attack. So it took time for people to catch on to this. If we could only look at the files and come to, again to an epiphany, oh wow, there's curious here, it could have been detected much earlier. So, how do we uh, manage to actually do this thing? And I'll spend four slides explaining how wonderful it would be if we could just look at a heap of uh, bytes and understand there's been key reuse here. Now, that's uh, nice, but how do we actually pull this off? Well, do you remember, has uh, any one of you ever got stuck in one of those early 90s quests, like somewhere in the Sorcerer and Monkey Island? Uh, when you're completely stuck and you have no more ideas of what to do, what do you do? That's right, you try everything on everything else until something works. So <laughs> this is what we're going to do here. Basically, if we take every byte from our original input and XOR it with every other byte, we're going to get this space, where again, every byte is XOR every other byte. As you can see, for example, this square will be the result of XOR in the R with the R, and it's going to be a null byte, because I think XOR with itself is a null byte. And every square, every tile in this space is going to be basically the XOR of the character from its column and the character from its row. What is this good for? We're going to see in a moment. First of all, this is what it looks like. As you can see, along the diagonal, everything is null bytes. Right, because it's a character XOR itself. So, what's our game plan based on the above? The, if we take our input, let's uh, look at uh, a typical input that we might want to operate on and uh, find something interesting. Let's uh, take this input, right? There's all sorts of noise in here. Somewhere in here are hidden two ciphertexts, each uh, encrypted, each are, they are both two different plain texts, encrypted with the same key. This is the thing that we are out uh, to find out. And if we XOR every byte with every other byte, somewhere in here, right, this is the first byte of this ciphertext, XOR with the first byte of this ciphertext. Why do we care? Because of the phenomenon that we saw earlier. If we XOR, the, fir the first byte of the two ciphertexts, the key byte cancels itself out. And the same uh, applies if we exert the second bytes of the two ciphertexts. And along this diagonal, right, if we go up one uh, unit and to the right one unit, we basically advance to the next character in both uh, strings. So along this white line, you can basically, you will be able to see the two ciphertexts with the XOR with each other, basically. The two different ciphertexts, XOR with each other, can be read along this uh, diagonal. And uh, why do we care? Again, because we saw earlier what happens if you do that. The key can set itself out. You could actually earlier see the smiley face and the send cache message. Uh, here, it's not going to be so obvious, but uh, it's still the, a step that uh, helps us see uh, what we need to do. Why? Because. When you take, uh, we, we come into this whole thing assuming something about the plaintext distribution that we are going to see. Plaintext is different from random characters, right? You expect letters, you expect punctuation, you expect, at any rate, the distribution is different. As opposed to random characters that are distributed evenly, the, this is not the plaintext distribution, this is the extra test distribution. This is the distribution that you get if you pick a random plaintext uh, character from the plaintext distribution, and then a number, uh, another uh, random character from the plaintext distribution, and you XOR the two of them. You get another distribution, and this distribution is again different from the random distribution. So it looks to us differently, right? If we look at the byte that came from uh, two different uh, plaintext uh, characters being XORed, it's going to appear different to us from just a random byte in the long run. So what are we going to do? We're going to scan 
this space that I mentioned earlier, we're going to first of all construct it and we're going to scan it diagonally in a diagonal fashion because the damning evidence, this is like a crime scene, and the damning evidence where all the bytes are going to look suspicious, look like they came out of a different distribution, not the random distribution, they are going to appear along a diagonal such as this. We, of course, we don't have all those colors and all this color guide when we come into this, all we have is the input, but we know that if we scan this diagonally and it just so happens that there's curious here somewhere, we're going to come across this diagonal eventually. And we're going to look basically, each byte is like a little piece of evidence that uh, may be pointing in the direction that uh, there's been curious here, and we are right now looking at uh, two ciphertexts that had been encrypted with the same key stream, XOR with each other. And we are going to work along the diagonals, and each time we come across a byte, we're going to pick it up and look at it and say, hmm, this looks like evidence for our hypothesis or maybe against our hypothesis. And if we walk along a diagonal, and we, found, we find an overwhelming amount, a sufficient amount of evidence that supports our, our hypothesis that there's been curious here, then we raise the alarm and we say this is enough evidence, there's no way this was a coincidence, there's been curious here, and the vulnerable ciphertext to the curious uh, exploiting attack are in this offset and this offset, and their length is so and so. Oh. This is the formula. I warned uh, you about it earlier. And uh, the, this, uh, this is the TLDR of the math involved. Basically, I said, uh, look at the evidence, look at the evidence. I'm going to have to mention what I mean by that. Basically, there's a, a quantifier, a rubric for deciding how much uh, a byte, a piece of evidence, influences uh, our hypothesis and makes us, think that, makes us think that the hypothesis is more likely. Uh, this is basically a computation involving the disparity between the probability that uh, this byte will arise uh, from the XOR text uh, distribution in blue that you saw earlier, and uh, the probability that it would, it would arise uh, randomly. I'm not going to actually go into the formula, but anyway, uh, it's important. And, uh, regarding the question of how much evidence is enough, this is an important question. We can set the bar high, we can set the bar low. Uh, we, for the sake of the proof of concept, we set the bar such that uh, one false positive is what we're willing to live with. Of course, you can send, uh, set it to a lower chance. It depends on the context where, to, where you're going to use this thing. And the question is, if we set the bar of evidence that high, can we actually detect something? Uh, because it may well be the case that if we're this demanding, when we come across the actual thing, that we're looking for the two XOR ciphertexts, we're not going to be able to find them because there won't be enough evidence. Uh, but as it turns out, <laughs> there's uh, this formula. It, uh, we found it using what's called the Chebyshev's inequality. The long and short of it is basically that uh, as long as the string, uh, the ciphertext uh, that we're looking for is long enough, every byte is going to give us some amount of evidence. Uh, positive evidence that uh, tells us that this may be the real thing. And basically, if the string is long enough, we're going to have enough evidence. The only question is it's a numbers game of what is the chance that we're going to fail anyway, even though the string was long enough in theory and we expected it to work. This is what Chevichev's inequality is for. It uh, bounces from above the probability that something unlikely will happen. So if the string is long enough, and if you look at the formula, you we'll be able to infer that uh, the long enough is uh, logarithmic in the length of the input, which is good. If we double the input, we just need one more character in the ciphertext for our alarm to ring. And uh, basi basically, this uh, is what it is. We we'll look at uh, the formula, and I, uh, I don't really expect uh, anyone here to just, uh, you know, look at it and... Uh, realize how the hell we came up with this thing, but uh, it's just a uh, proof that we looked into it that this algorithm should work in theory. Now, uh, that's all uh, nice and good, but uh, we're going to have to actually show how it works in practice, uh, because uh, I don't think looking at the formula convinced anyone here very much. Uh, basically, we're going to look at a sort of heat map 
uh, you're going to see what the algorithm sees when it operates. Uh, when the algorithm iterates over the space that we constructed earlier, it's going to look at different bytes, and each byte is going to look like more evidence or less evidence for the uh, hypothesis that we're looking at the uh, case of curious. And the areas, the bytes that, uh, are, that contribute more evidence are going to be in red, and the bytes that contribute less evidence are going to be in blue. And the algorithm looks for diagonals that are basically streaks. There are lots and lots of uh, evidence for our hypothesis, and they're going to appear in red. We're now going to look at the heat, heat map of the uh, evidence heat map of the Ramnit communication that I mentioned earlier. Well, first of all, there's this. Ignore this. This is the main diagonal. This is the diagonal where the input is XOR diff itself. It's all null bytes, so of course it uh, looks suspicious to the algorithm. It doesn't look random at all. But uh, if you look a bit further, can you see it? Here it is. This is the a long diagonal, a unique diagonal, of uh, where the algorithm is going to detect the curious because there is a streak of evidence here along this diagonal. Yeah, you can see it is actually elliptic uh, for anyone who, for some reason, can't see laser pointers. And this is this is uh, the map for the second case. It's a bit more difficult. I don't know if anyone can see it here, but again, you have the main diagonal, and uh, it's trivial. But this is the heat map of uh, two files encrypted by the decrypt uh, malware that uh, I talked about earlier. And uh, the two files were. Hmm? The two files were encrypted uh, using the same key stream, so it, we should be able to see the key reuse. If we look at this, it's going to appear as a red diagonal somewhere here, and uh, it's uh, here, right? Uh, the diagonal is over here. It's uh, the red diagonal where every byte basically looks like looks suspicious, looks more or less like it came out not of uh, not out of a random distribution, but out of a distribution of uh, plain text bytes, XOR plain text bytes, right? Uh, so I don't know if you noticed, but basically we have uh, succeeded in our plan. Uh, we have managed to just take the input, not knowing anything about it from uh, beforehand, and Com computed all sorts of uh, properties regarding the XORs of uh, different bytes, and the algorithm is able, just like you are able to look at this diagonal and uh, automatically detect where the key use is, so uh, can the algorithm. Let's see if we have uh, time for the demo. I see the other demo isn't working for some reason. Well, never mind, the other demo wasn't as exciting as this one because uh, it basically it showed you a script running, the script that generates this. Uh, basically, the Ramnit uh, malware that uh, we saw earlier, it uh, sends uh, this communication, and the script iterates over this, and eventually the script runs across, you actually see the script uh, running across this uh, diagonal and uh, accumulating evidence. It says, I see this amount of uh, positive evidence, this amount of positive evidence, and it grows and it grows. Eventually, it terminates because it runs across the end of the input, and then it says, aha, I found it. Uh, I found the, the curious, and it uh, outputs the two offsets. So actually, this is the more exciting thing. Uh, there's no need to look at the demo to understand what's going on here. Uh, we have succeeded uh, in our plan uh, by uh, <laughs> using the game plan that I have uh, outlined earlier. And uh, I really hope uh, that uh, this thing will be useful. I plan on uh, uploading it. And uh, as, 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 at the moment that I can actually get the code to a state where I can actually give it to someone to look at and then later look them in the eye, this is going to be un uh, uploaded uh, for the sake of anyone who wants to take a look at it. And uh, this, this is basically it. Uh, I uh, hope uh, that uh, you now uh, understand better uh, what Curious is and uh, how we detect it using this method. Okay, and
Thank you. No, any questions at all? Okay. The heat map? This one. Hmm. Test. I was wondering uh, about the totally not suspicious horizontal line at the bottom. Yeah, the horizontal lines, they are probably they are artifact. Basically, what's a horizontal line? You're, this is a specific uh, character from one of the, uh, from the plain text, XORed with the rest uh, of the decipher text. It's basically, it uh, doesn't have an application to what we were talking about earlier, because specifically when you XOR to a cipher text, it's going to appear along the diagonal. Um, probably it's one uh, specific byte of the cipher text that when XORed with itself produced uh, some sort of anomaly. Uh, thankfully, it doesn't uh, appear along the diagonal, so we're not going to suffer any false positives because of it. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, once the uh, segments where the the same stream stream size, the cipher stream, the key stream is mm -hmm. used, reused. Mm -hmm. Once you identify these segments, which amount of manual uh, decryption do you need to recover the plain text? Uh, actually, uh, I saw uh, an essay published exactly on this. There's automatic methods for extracting uh, the plain text in this case, where you already have two ciphertexts that you know are vulnerable to the attack. It doesn't work on 100% of the cases, but I, I saw this apply to the actual case of World 2003 encryption, and uh, it works pretty nicely. It's, uh, you don't have to use uh, manual work uh, in order to decrypt this. There's automatic uh, methods for doing that. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to know the byte distribution of the plain text yes, before. That, yeah. Yes, that's right. You need to. And actually, these heat maps were generated with a guess. We came in with a guess of what plain text more or less looks like. Uh, you're going to have some uh, uppercase le letters and lowercase letters and characters and such. And uh, hopefully, this, uh, our guess is going to be close enough to any case of actual plain text that is, the alarm is going to raise regardless of the actual precise distribution. Uh, there's one question from IRC. Yes, thanks. Um, the question from the internet. Um, are the docs somewhere available you refer to? Hmm? Are the documents available somewhere? Uh, the documents. Uh, no, they're not, but uh, as I said, I'm planning to uh, work this out and uh, upload this, and uh, I will uh, put out a notice uh, at the moment uh, that this will be available. Two. Hannes Trufinik, um, thanks for showing these vulnerabilities with stream service. Um, in, in general today, I think uh, for anyone, the recommendation is not to use stream ciphers at all. Um, so I think if anyone, including malware designers, um, want to design their own crypto system, mm -hmm. which is obviously a stupid idea, um, mm -hmm. then they should better be, use, uh, be using uh, these AAD ciphers, uh, authenticating encryption mm -hmm. uh, ciphers. Yeah, yeah this and is true. Then, because not only, uh, because what you didn't mention uh, was just encrypting the data uh, in the way you did alone is not sufficient. You also need the uh, the key message digest along with it, mm -hmm. and which, the, which these newer ciphers would actually bring you. And that's the reason why in the new versions of uh, transport layer security that's being worked on, you don't find any of these stream ciphers anymore because they're insecure. Yeah, this is true. Actually, the malware, malwares often use stream ciphers because they're easy to implement. Uh, RC4, for example, is very popular because it's easy to implement. And uh, this is why you see it, as you can understand, uh, achieving actual uh, security, good security, is not the first thing uh, on their minds. I don't know what Microsoft was thinking to themselves, but the, the malware author doing this, basically they said to themselves, okay, I'm going to use encryption, but uh, apparently he didn't go much farther than that. Yeah, back to three. Uh, hi. So just a quick question about here. <laughs> just a quick question about the visualization part. Mm -hmm. So, are you doing like uh, just 
bit for bit because this is like two colors, right? Or is it more colors? Yeah, like the colors, how, how do you, the how colors do you basically, I looked at uh, a random distribution of uh, RGB values from red to blue, and uh, I computed its standard deviation and its mean, which is, of course, in the middle. And then, basically, I looked at the distribution of evidence along uh, this, uh, the values of evidence that appear here. And uh, I used the matching function from the first mean for, uh, from the evidence array to the mean of the colors, and uh, I computed the uh, calibrated grades right uh, of uh, the value of the evidence values uh, relative to the mean of the evidence, and uh, divided by the standard deviation mm -hmm. uh, to but, come up with the z score. But this is like byte for byte for byte. Yes, right? this is yeah, okay. byte for byte, right? Uh, you said that with uh, with uh, stream ciphers like RC4 are vulnerable to this um, problem, but what about um, when you um, use CTIS and CTR mode or encounter mode or something like this? What's also um, vulnerable to this problem? I think when you the, use, I'll just use explain the class of ciphers vulnerable to this problem is every cipher where you come up with a key stream of some sort, basically there's a random key, and you get the ciphertext by XORing the, the plain text with this key stream. Any other kind of cipher, as I said uh, earlier, block ciphers or anything like that is not vulnerable to this kind of attack. But uh, what happens when you use in the counter mode and you reuse the nouns? I, uh, I, think I, I, don't, I don't understand. Can you please repeat the question? Um, when you use the counter mode and uh, we use the nouns from um, uh, I think this, wouldn't this result in the th same problem? I think... When you... What? Uh, when you use AES and the counter oh, yes. mode... No, no. I, uh, no, okay. no because the, you mean because there's an uh, X-ring somewhere within the operation of the cipher. No, yeah. this, this is yeah. really, really a specific artifact of the fact that you do a linear operation. The ciphertext is a linear function of the plain text and uh, the random key. The moment that your oper uh, encryption operation involves X or operation, but it isn't wholly linear, there are stages of it that make sure that it is not linear, then the result is not vulnerable to this kind of attack anymore. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, I guess we're done. So, so thank you, Ben, again. Mm -hmm.